after followed by the pound sign. Okay, very much. Um, this is a project that has been been ongoing actually for a few years now, uh, anticipating natural uh, elements in in lake effect snow bands. And Bernard on at Gaylord, Michigan, has uh, kind of jumped on board here in the last year or so. And He's been looking at this a little bit in his area as well. Uh, for an outline of this uh, project, uh, first of all, we'll over uh, the motivation for doing it in the first place, uh, some of the goals of uh, what we hope to accomplish, uh, a brief review of some of uh, earlier research on the uh, morphology of lake effect uh, precip bands, uh, our methodology uh, in the research, some initial results, and then uh, potentially demonstrate how this could be used uh, operationally. Uh, for the motivation, um, can people thinking with uh, with effect snow bands operate as far as uh, uh, and what we basically by structure of a lake effect band is that a well organized constant or sharp appearance on on radar imagery, or is it just broken up into a bunch of a cellular snow bands? And conventional thinking with with uh, convective mode there is that it tends to follow the diurnal heating cycle and also to a certain extent time of year. And a lot of times that works fairly well. Uh, lake effect snow bands tend to achieve their best organization overnight into the early morning hours and they tend to, uh, to uh, break up into more individual cellular elements uh, with the heating of the day in the afternoon and to the early evening. There's definitely times where that doesn't apply and that we've been, uh, we've been fooled in the past. And so that, that, that got us to thinking that it may be a little bit more complex than just the time of year, the time of year that you're involved in. Okay, so the goal basically is to try to uh, if possible, the atmospheric parameters that tend to govern uh, the uh, the convective mode here, and then if we can come up with something to utilize that information to formulate a uh, predictive technique. Uh, this is just a brief overview of some earlier research. Um, some work with individual papers that were written in the late 80s and 90s, and, and the upshot of them was is that uh, for things like roll like convection, uh, with lake effect snow typically is, uh, the parameters they tend to prevail in is in the low levels, uh, fairly strong flow, uh, uh, the strong speed shear with height in the low two kilometers or so. Uh, you need some measure of low-level heat flux or instability to get these bands to form in the first place. Research seemed to indicate that there's an upper limit. Uh, if you have too much instability, uh, they tend to break up into individual cellular snow showers as opposed to a well-organized band. Uh, in 2003, uh, there was a uh, uh, pretty well documented uh, lake effect snow research project, the Lake Ice Experiment over the end of Lake Michigan. And uh, this map here that the uh, black box there on the northern end of the lake kind of shows the study area that they looked at with uh, um, aircraft flights 
and, and soundings and, and all sorts of things. And pretty much the results of that kind of verified earlier results I just outlined is that good low speed shear and added but not overwhelmingly amounts of boundary layer cave is what seemed to produce the, the best organization of lake effect snow bands. This is just a schematic showing uh, uh, what could be the case in a multi-band uh, and you see kind of a transverse circulation where uh, they, they tend to feed upward motion in the middle of these bands and, and kind of downward motion in between uh, showing some separation there and helping the bands to stay well organized and, and typically the strong uh, low level speed shear with height kind of helps in this regard as well. So, given the established through prior research uh, and, and forecast experience, the importance of both low-level speed shear and at least some uh, boundary layer instability to the, the a good organization of a lake effect snow band, the questions that followed after that, well, is there a preferred amount of either one? Is there some sort of balance between them? And if that was the case, how would you quantify it and then try to illustrate it in the first process? So initial methodology is uh, what we did here in our forecast area. We, we have quite an extensive lake effect snow database here that goes back to the early 2000s. We decided to, to look at three or four uh, winters worth of lake effect snow events. Really, we only looked at the late season cases, kind of thinking those were the more important ones. But the more we thought about it, we just sort of filled it in to look at the higher uh, uh, winter season here. Uh, we used a lot of radar imagery, obviously, and uh, not only actual soundings, but forecast model soundings. Uh, we used the NAM model at, at the uh, conventional six hourly time step 0612 in Zulu. And uh, originally, the specific site uh, relative uh, to a lake effect snow band was chosen based on its proximity to the band or the lake effect precip itself. And then uh, when I uh, kind of got involved in the project in the, the Gaylord forecast area, he also started looking at some events from, from his region in uh, northern Michigan. And looking at some more recent events too since 2010 in New York State. And uh, one of the things that we've done recently is uh, we tried to come up with a little bit of a different uh, methodology for at least assessing the stability. Uh, what Austin did in his area is he is, as a looking at just individual sites, he more of an aerial average. As far as assessing the uh, the cape over the the land areas, and I think that lends itself well to this project because what we're really looking for is the background state stability. Uh, the snow band has already moved over a particular location, and it's it's kind of analogous to the warm season when a uh, sounding can be contaminated by thunderstorms. Uh, you can start building the cape almost artificially in a sense, uh, right in the center line of these bands. And so uh, for purposes of this work, you're better off looking at kind of the background state or almost the pre-stability before the band moves in. And I'm in the process of kind of, of trying to retrofit some of my data now to use the uh, aerial average stability concept. Okay, so uh, the originally chosen parameters for stability, we basically used, as you would expect, lapse rates. Uh, we looked at both uh, uh, CAPE over land, terrestrial CAPE, also some lake-induced CAPE values. And shear, we were basically looking at speed shear in the mixed layer, and more specifically uh, in the lowest kilometer AGL. And as 
far as some of the results go, what we basically did is we did a bunch of statistical correlations. Uh, whenever I saw, I, I kind of, we sort of quantitatively defined based on radar whether a well-defined band, kind of broken, uh, diffuse-looking band, or just uh, out and out open cellular snow showers. And uh, correlations of certain parameters that we just outlined to the radar presentation. Uh, I have highlighted here some of the parameters that, that seem to work out the best. Uh, cape over the land surface, uh, the more unstable you are over the land, uh, it seems to lend itself more to open cellular snow shower activity. It's not a surprise in finding. Um, we did look some at the lake-induced cape. Um, as far as the normalized lake-induced cape, that seemed to show a little bit more promise versus just looking at this specific thing. Uh, values of lake-induced capes seem to favor more well-organized bands. Uh, the stronger flow, uh, particularly again in a normalized sense in the mix layer or, or even more in the lowest kilometer, uh, stronger speed shear with height seem to go well with organized uh, lake effect bands. The scatter plot diagram with some of the initial points, uh, and what I did is I uh, did just uh, cape values over the land uh, versus normalized bulk speed in the mix layer. And initial separation is pretty good. Uh, the coloring convention here, the dark blue marks represent events that had well-defined uh, lake effect bands via the radar. The yellow coloring is more the, you had banded structures, but they seemed to suffer a little bit. They were more diffuse in nature. And the purple coloring is more of the uh, just broken up snow showers. So I put some lines of best fit on here. And, and again, you know, the initial separation was pretty good. The way find uh, banded cases seem to congregate more in the upper left-hand side of the scatter plot where you had strong speed shear, a peak cape. The uh, open cellular snow shower seemed to congregate more in the lower right-hand side where you had, had weaker shear and uh, more unstable conditions over the land. And then the more diffuse ones were between. So the uh, initial result here uh, actually came out well. Uh, so what Justin did, he looked at some more recent cases for his area in northern Michigan, and he did a, a similar methodology scatter plot of cape uh, bottom and uh, and shear on the y-axis over to the left. And it seemed like the most important um, a driver for organization in his area was more the stability, the cape, where um, most of your well-defined bands. Uh, which were the blue dots for him, um, seemed to her when you had a uh, land cape of less than about 15 joules. And the more unstable you got over the land, uh, the more of a chance there is of getting uh, uh, cellular snow showers or more diffuse looking bands. Also looked at some uh, lake-induced cape versus overland cape uh, scatter plot. This is just for the New York cases, and the same coloring convention: dark blue is uh, well-organized bands, down to purple, which is the more cellular snow showers. And this may didn't come out quite as well separation-wise as the initial scatter plot does, but again, you can see in general. Well-defined uh, lake effect bands had your more stable terrestrial conditions, generally capes of under about 20 joules. Um, the more stable you got, definitely these bands seem to suffer in organization. And 
And I didn't annotate this line on here. As far as the lake-induced cape, um, if you were to probably draw a line maybe around 350 or 400 joules for the lake-induced cape, you go too much above there, um, a, a very high percentage of well-organized uh, lake effect bands as opposed to any other kind of mode. Again, not terribly surprising. Um, so, again, sort of the upper uh, left-hand part of this scatter plot seems to favor the well-organized bands, whereas the, uh, the low band seems to favor more the uh, disorganized activities. So, maybe the ultimate answer here is to try to, to, to somehow combine those three elements, the lake-induced cape, the terrestrial cape for stability proxy, and then the, uh, the shear as well. So, uh, as an original validation, how much skill could be in, uh, something like a nomogram or a scatter plot based on this research be over and above simply just assuming uh, uh, every day between about 18Z and maybe 0200Z, uh, you're going to have more disorganized lake effect versus uh, uh, better organized banded structures late at night into the early morning. So that's kind of what we wanted to, to try to look at. And what I did is I just did a, a, a quick and dirty with some of the initial results. Um, a graphical comparison here, the purple here, what I call a diurnal technique is for simplicity's sake, I assumed um, every 18Z and 0Z, if you were to assume the band was going to be organized in nature as opposed to 6Z, 12Z, that you were going to have a more organized band. And basically, the, um, the darker, the more magenta uh, bars here go uh, using uh, both higher POD and a lower false alarm for combination of, of uh, stability and shear on the original scatter plot using that to determine your organization versus just making assumptions based on the time of day. Uh, and it seemed that this technique does show a lot of improvement over simply uh, assumptions based on time of day. Uh, as a proof of initial proof of concept here, we had an event that occurred uh, a couple of years ago in March. It uh, seemed like an event where where a, a lake effect band that had not shown much organization during the late afternoon, early evening, conditions to us kind of were anecdotally and based on on forecaster experience that this band would become well organized after about 3 or 4Z in the evening and there was some fairly heavy uh, snowfall amounts. We had several lake effect snow warnings and advisories east of Lake Ontario for this event. This is a sampling of some radar images from, uh, from Binghamton, New York on the left-hand side and from uh, Montague, New York on the Tug Hill on the right. And it's late at night, 0600 Zulu, and you can see by the presentation of the radar, um, at this time the bands had not become uh, well organized, especially on the TYX. Um, uh, really hard to discern uh, any band structures at all from that perspective. There were some maybe diffuse banded structures on the Binghamton radar at that time. This was an example of buff kit sounding from uh, Ithaca, New York at 6E. If you look on the right-hand side on the profile, especially in the lowest kilometer or so, so the winds were, were not that strong. It was fairly weak uh, speed shear in the mix layer for this event, which I think ended up being a uh, key here. And this 
is a plot of some of the uh, snowfall totals for this event. And you can see the amounts were pretty underwhelming. They are in inches. Uh, a lot of uh, one to three inch, uh, even less than one inch amounts in spots. We were able to barely squeak out an advisory um, in the county here in northern Oneida in the far northern end of our forecast area. But the amounts were quite underwhelming compared to uh, the forecast for this event. I did is I plotted both uh, at 60, where I showed you that buffkit image, and at 12Z the next morning, based on the terrestrial cape and the speed shear in the mixed layer, it would have fallen on the nomogram. And see, uh, the, the overarching idea the nomogram would have tried to give you here is that there just wasn't sufficient uh, flow or speed shear to compensate for the uh, levels of instability over the land, even late at night into the early morning. Um, so it's always 2020, of course, but uh, if back then we had had access to the nomogram theoretically and, and looked at some of those values over time, uh, I'd have raised a slight red flag that perhaps these bands are not going to look as good as we, as we think they might. And to summarize things, uh, based on uh, new results of our research plus prior research, uh, how well lake effect bands are able to remain consolidated, slant organized inland seems to hinge on some sort of preferred balance of a boundary layer stability and speed shear in the mix layer. Basically, um, uh, an adequate amount, but not too much instability and strong flow slant speed shear seem to be the ingredients that work best. If the shear is not adequate and the instability is too great, have either just open cellular activity or disorganized band features. And again, to summarize, I, uh, I drew a best fit line on the initial scatter plot. It, it seemed to show promise in discriminating uh, using the uh, stability parameters and CAPE uh, between banded events, diffuse bands, and open cellular. Uh, especially more, I call them the oddball cases uh, where you get disorganized events at night or well-organized bands during the afternoon when you think they may break up. Uh, it seems to be these kind of events where this, uh, this technique would probably be most useful. So, uh, future work. Um, in the end, I need to kind of finish tabulating uh, the aerial average uh, um, parameters and, and add some more recent events, uh, more up to the present. Uh, with with both the uh, the Western Lake events that I just and looked at in Michigan, and also for our events farther east in New York, uh, necessary maybe make some refinements to the scatter plots or nomograms. Uh, several suggestions in the past, since you're looking at uh, again almost analogous to a warm season kind of thinking, you're looking at stability and shear combos. Could you have some sort of modified bulk Richardson? That's something that hasn't been done yet but um, uh, potentially could be. I mean, we could see the usefulness of that. Hopefully get this work into the literature over time. As the buff kit application goes, um, and if, if maybe over time, uh, since buff kit has the advantage of hourly time resolution, if we were had enough confidence in our results, maybe insert a uh, nomogram and buff kit and you could plot over time perhaps uh, the uh, expected organization or lack thereof of, of an event. And that's all I have. Any questions for Michael? Hi, Eastern Region. Sure. So to look and pair with model simulation.
simulations, uh, especially some of the convective models, to try to see if they had out in some of these cases as to the type of bands might develop. And I guess I maybe the second part, I had thought there was some research in this area as to when you might expect single bands, multi bands, uh, and some convection. Uh, is there just a lot of documented research in this area? Um, so, two questions. Thanks. To address uh, the, the high res uh, models, you know, especially looking at simulated reflectivity, um, I really haven't done, I don't know if I can speak for Justin if he has, um, I really haven't looked a whole lot to see how, how models are, say, 12 to 24 hours out of, of being able to, I would expect they would have some skill, um, but, but that being said, I, I haven't done a side-by-side -side comparison um, uh, too much with that. As far as um, existing research on this, um, I haven't seen a lot of documented. I, I, I've seen little projects done here and there, but I haven't seen a whole lot in the literature um, specifically dealing with this. So if you or anybody else knows of something, I, 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 I'd love to see it. Okay, I think that actually makes sense. I mean, the more I think about it, we have the documentation on kind of the climatologies and the existence of different types, but I'm not sure there has been a lot of documentation in terms of parental lead to it. So if you can get it, then all the better. That's the goal. Thanks. Sales here in Toronto. Uh, what about your nomogram? You draw in lines on there. I think you said lines of something like that. But you're trying to divide areas of the different um, different modes. Uh, but you have overlap there. So I would think it's better to try to identify the space where those modes occur and have overlap. And that's what's in the uh, the supercell or the um, this organization nomogram that's in the kit, there's actually lines that overlap and, and allow you to know that there's a, a regions in, in that space where uh, you could go to the other. Good suggestion, Dave. I, I, I've thought about that recently, too, because I, I think in almost anything like this, you're going to have lines of um, Higher uncertainty, if you will, lower predictability, where it where it could reasonably be one or the other. So, I think your idea of incorporating overlap is 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 a good one. Stop it there, just because uh, we're running out of time. We're going to go over twelve, so I hope that's okay with everyone. I'm just